Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the seminar called uh, Towards Reaching Science and Decision Making. Uh, this seminar is uh, organized jointly by the Estonian Academy of Sciences and the Fort Sight Center of Estonian Parliament. And it is supported by the European Commission uh, Joint Research Center. My name is uh, Arvi Freiberg. I am a vice president of the Estonian Academy of Sciences. And my responsibility is here is basically to, to look and watch, to keep order in, in the audience. Now, I have a great pleasure to uh, offer this place to Maida Rutte, who is a, a Deputy Director General of the European Commission Joint Research Centre for the opening address. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be back here. And let me just check whether there is any opportunity that I get the other microphone, because I feel that I'm almost disappearing behind this very important but, uh, um, but really impressive. I'll try with this one, is it? Yes, that's much better. I feel like I'm now really belonging to the people here in the room. So thank you for joining us for this afternoon session. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today, and I wanted to uh, share with you a couple of thoughts as a way of introduction on my behalf and on behalf of my joint research center of the European Commission where I, where I work. I think all of us have realized that we live uh, at complex and very fast-changing times. And the times are such that uh, we are all flooded with information, we get too many emails. I was just discussing here with some participants that even if they get emails from the, Europe, from the uh, Estonian Research Council, which normally is for them a very important partner, but if there are seven emails a day, you may not necessarily read all of them. So we have too much information, we are flooded by data, and often when we need to take decisions, we are not really certain which way it should go. So the appeal of uh, simple solutions, which are often promoted by populist parties, is getting stronger and stronger. But of course, these simple solutions are often not the right ones. And we believe that um, at these times where Europe is again facing also very important uh, decisions to make, and where the countries like Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania have important decisions, policy making ahead of them, it's important to have also really good basis for decision making. So evidence, facts, modeling, all these data that help uh, our politicians and our ministries to reach the best possible uh, ways forward. And we also believe that in order to really achieve it, a very good collaboration and good coordination between various parties is essential. And with this in mind, I'm particularly happy to um, welcome today everybody to this um, event because this is a good example of such collaboration happening in real, in real life. We have here not only participants from Estonia, but we have also Latvia and Lithuania present. And of course, the organizers today are from the two, uh, or I would even say three parties, if you wish. We have, of course, the Academy of Sciences, and we also have the uh, national parliament here putting their forces together to uh, discuss important uh, matters. And from my side, uh, I'm of course coming from the European Commission and uh, we have the pleasure of um, promoting such events throughout, um, throughout Europe. So today's event is one of the, one of the 25 or so uh, conferences which we are um, organizing together with various host, uh, local um, partners throughout Europe this year. And it's, it builds on a tradition. It builds on a tradition which um, we have now tested for two or three years. 
The initial ones were in 2015, 2016, where we had um, events we called Science Meets Regions, where we were testing similar formats of discussion, debate at regional level throughout different um, uh, places uh, in Europe. Then we followed uh, at European Parliament level with this Science Meets Parliament concept, where it's not only a conference, which is useful, but it's also kind of a pairing scheme, uh, putting scientists and members of parliaments together on a topic which the member of parliament wants to particularly focus on. So, and then a further element is to add some bit of funding for maybe some studies, uh, which uh, in our case, Joint Research Center can do, or uh, from other sources would be, would be funded. So why is the Joint Research Center of the European Commission taking such uh, initiatives? Well, we do it because, of course, by doing so, we promote evidence-based uh, policy making, but we also see that our own mandate or our raison d'etre, the reason why the Joint Research Center has been created, actually is very much about promoting better policy making. And in the, in the European Commission, we have the role of being internal, so in-house science service, but we are also knowledge service. And one of the points I'm going to make tomorrow in my, in my talk is that it's not enough to just generate knowledge. knowledge. It's not enough if scientists bring about facts and evidence. There has, to be, there has to be a way of actually transmitting it. There has to be a knowledge management element in place whereby we find the ways of the of the, um, kind of the collaboration to really make sense, so that the people who have responsibilities in the ministries or in the political parties would have the opportunity to also feed back their needs to the scientific circles. And there would be ways of uh, really learning together and co-creating together the content that would be needed for, for governance. So this is something that we would like to uh, discuss and, and try uh, during these two, three days here in Estonia. And I'm going to have one of my collaborators, Milena Raikovska, joining uh, us here as well, exactly trying to transmit um, some of these mes messages that we have learned in the Joint Research Center. And of course, you yourselves, with uh, your practice and your experience, uh, you will do the same. Then maybe I also would like to say is that um, this event today is among one of the first ones uh, of the series of 25 uh, events this year. It is sponsored by the European Parliament. They gave us uh, funds to organize these events. And uh, thanks to the good uh, collaborators here in Estonia, we have, as I said, kind of a good example of uh, being not only one country specific, but three countries joining. And next week, if uh, any of you um, would have the opportunity to come to Brussels, the European Parliament is going to have a two days event exactly on this Science Meets Parliament, where the highest commission level officials and the Parliament President will be present. And we will discuss many of the topics that are very, very timely. I'm very happy to say that among the topics which we cover uh, next week, is going to be also um, the um, future of mobility. And Tallinn uh, Technology University, Taltec, is going to be present with their uh, autonomous driving car <laughs> and, and presenting the work um, that, is do, but that is done here um, in, uh, in Estonia. With this, I would like to actually wish all of us a very lively two, two and a half, two days. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing back from, uh, from the seminar, from the discussions and debates, and hopefully we are all going to go back uh, home uh, to our workplaces inspired by these um, discussions. Thank you. And now the word is given to the President of Estonian Academy of Sciences, Tarmo Sommer. Your Excellencies, Ministers, Directors, High Officers, Simple Mortals, Ladies and Gentlemen, 
Um, Estonia is not a science or evidence-based country. It's a citation of the, from the Minister of Education of Science, Mr. Jürgen Ligi, three and a half years ago in a conference in Rigigogu, the Parliament of Estonia. And then he had uh, a few clear and sharp and, I would say, painful arguments to support this conjecture. This, this situation hasn't changed much, except for one small A4 paper sheet with signatures of the leaders of the major political parties, representatives of scientists, Estonian academic sciences and young academic sciences, and uh, representatives of big business. And they all confirmed in this paper that it is an, an imperative to increase science funding in Estonia so that the public sector will contribute at the level of 1% of GDP into research, development, and, and innovation. Estonian Academy of Sciences has a clear view. Estonia must become a science-driven and evidence-driven country. This target has been one of the focal points why we, together with our partners, are work, uh, were working towards organizing this particular event. And in the light of this A4 sheet paper, uh, this, this target is becoming more and more feasible. And there is currently a massive discussion about how exactly the additional funds should be materialized for the benefit of both science and society. In Estonian language, I think in many other languages, there is a saying that now the ball, like in basketball, is in the hands of scientific community. And it's always a good question, which moves are necessary to reach the, the remote target? One thing to do is to uh, create a, 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 a clean, or, uh, to or, or to create or to clean a channel uh, of ideas, facts, and competence uh, that could be used in decision making. But communication is not just shooting bits into darkness. The meaning of information as such is simple, inconvenient, but straightforward. Characters on paper or bits in the internet, they become information only when read and understood. This means two are needed to dance tango. The two have to talk the same language to formulate questions and, and understand the answers and, and arguments in, in the same con context, context. Otherwise, it won't work. So the basic, the target of those two nights, surrounded by, <coughs> by discussions and presentations, uh, it's to make just a tiny step towards better understanding between top scientists between those who, whose profession is to advise and those who have the mandate of making decisions. And we know that even the most beautiful language, and we think Estonian language is one of the most beauty beautiful, it consists of simple words and single words. So let's learn some words. What we could try to understand jointly here, uh, around those two nights, jointly with top scientists and policymakers, is um, how or, or in, each, in which format the advice from scientific landscape Together, they have to admit that the other side is extremely good as well, whatever side it is. 
And this is really crucial as many uh, decisions affect our lives and the entire society for a long time. And some of them might be irreversible. So let's also talk and understand what should never happen in science advice process. In other words, to discuss the to-dos and never do's of advice. And let's try to imagine how the different roles and different institutions have different functions. One function is advisory, completely different functions in lobby work, and the third function is protest and critics. They should be harmonized, but not overlapping. It is well known it is that it's not that important what exactly we say. Much more important is what our partner or society hears, or, or what he or she thinks he hears. We have a selection here of stories and recommendations of top experts from the FLAG ERA network, Future ICT 2.0, its cognitive studies. It's about how the messages of different kinds spread, compete, live their own lives, and impact on, on people and society. And this is particularly important when hot topics are being discussed and, and policymakers only handle hot topics. Other things are just irrelevant. It is equally important how we say the things. The ideal message is not only scientifically correct, but also clear, transparent, and adequately put into context, and also presented attractively. It is possible to train all those aspects. And we have engaged some of the very best people in Estonia to give us advice on these aspects on Saturday. And last but not least, uh, the organizers are deeply interested in any ideas or recommendations that you all may have. Please be active in work groups. Your opinion matters, and it may serve as part of science advice system in the future. The event uh, has been initiated and is supported by the uh, Joint Research Centre in the framework of the activity Science Meet Parliaments, Science Meets Regions. Today the majority here are scientists and the minority are parliament members, but still they at least meet each other. There are more than one parliament members. Um, if there will be more, even more, it will be many. So it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event. But before going to the content, um, some words about housekeeping. If there will be something extremely unlikely, fire alarm, then do not use the balcony doors. <laughs> use the doors from which you enter the room. Um, the work groups, as I told, probably will be the very best part of, of this event, uh, except possibly for the dinners. Um, we, we tried to maximally account uh, for into all wishes what we had, but uh, sometimes our rooms are not uh, flexible enough. Who haven't been signed up to the workshops uh, or work groups, please do so. Uh, during the, the coffee break. It will come pretty soon. And the recommendation is that uh, the English language participants uh, should uh, primarily uh, go into those workshops which are mentioned as English. Otherwise, we could be in a situation when we really can't express ourselves uh, as uh, um, exactly as we would like to. And then, when the work uh, group activity is over, the dinner today here will be just in this room, 
And uh, it would be really great to hear some good ideas from every group very shortly, three minutes, maximum five minutes, just for the discussion, so that the best ideas would not be lost, but, but somehow recalled it. Uh, and with that, I think the, it's really time to go into content and start real work. Thank you very much for investing your time here today. So we are precisely in time to st start with uh, first speaker. And the first speaker will be uh, Christian Vassil. And he is a uh, uh, vice director of the, uh, on research of Tartu University. And his talk title is Sensors, Data, Decisions from Evidence to Policy. Thank you very much. With your kind permission, I do as Maiva did to be a little bit. True, but still. Okay, does it work? Yeah. And I presume it's with this one, right? So, hello from uh, uh, my end. Uh, my name is Christian Wessel. I'm a vice rector of research of the University of Tartu. But today, um, I would like to start putting actually using the other hat that I also have, and that is a hat of a researcher, as a senior research, researcher of technology studies in the Institute of uh, uh, Political Science uh, in the University of Tartu. And I would like to take you through some of the dramatic examples where we have miserably failed in translating evidence into policy. And I use this dramatization only to drive my talk toward solutions that can be used um, as, a, as, a, as a basis, as a kickoff for uh, further discussion. I definitely do not pretend that there's going to be an exhaustive uh, uh, manual to be handed out how we from now onward uh, should and ought to be uh, uh, implementing uh, policy. But allow me to start with a with uh, with something that would work. No, that doesn't. No? Let's see. Update is ready to install. Uh, this is great. Okay, let's see how it works now. Okay. <coughs> That's Microsoft, yes. So the question, the, the, the main uh, topic of my talk is how to get from sensing the outside world through various steps to getting into decision making and policy. And that involves steps related to data, analytical inference, understanding something on the level of mechanisms, the cause and effect, translating this into knowledge, and then further into decision and further into policy. But I would like to start with a much broader uh, introduction to the topic. Uh, if you think about the past 20, 30 years, then the world outside has dramatically changed. Some say that we live through the fourth industrial revolution, that is characterized by the fusion of technologies that have been out there. Others say that we live in a second machine age, where machines are coming for the second time and that have the effect, effect to change um, various aspects of, uh, of human behavior and the way in which society is, uh, is put together. And irrespective of uh, which denomination you belong to or which, uh, which literature you've been, you've been reading, the commonality between the two is something uh, that is described as this. The world outside, the major difference from the world that we knew from 30 years ago is described by large sensory networks that didn't exist 
at the extent that we have today, those sensory networks produce immense amount of data in or in nearly real time. If we want to harness those data, then the old analytical techniques, methods, no longer work. We can use the old methods, but they require a clear add-on computational capacity and particularly self-learning capacities that iteratively learn the patterns in the data. And those can be used for evidence-based decision-making in an automated fashion. And it has been agreed that we see those aspects affecting, affecting um, virtually all aspects of, uh, uh, of human uh, behavior. So narrowing now down the environment of the, or the approach from the, from the outside world uh, into Estonia, I would like to, I mean, you're all familiar with the, with the, with the fact, um, which I think it is now a fact, of Estonia as the leading uh, country in digital governance. What is not so well known is perhaps and I would like to highlight uh, this, is Estonia's ability to produce, through its sensory network, um, data that can be used for evidence-made policymaking. We always talk about, implicitly, about the Estonian e-government, but what is its actual uh, breadth and depth? Is, uh, is kind of, you know, implicitly uh, only stated. So, what you see here is, um, is, the mo is the most fundamental component of our e-government. We call it the X-Road, which is a data exchange layer that binds together various um, uh, uh, governmental registries and allows producing what we call public digital, uh, the range of public digital services in a unified and secure uh, fashion. What is not so well known is that X-Road is also a sensory network which central log logs the transactions happening within the ecosystem of Estonian e-government. We have used those uh, log data, of course in an anonymized uh, format, and uh, they produce an immense amount of data by about 50% of the population being already connected at least once to uh, X-Road. So let's look at the scope and the breadth of uh, uh, Estonian e-government. And let's first focus on the, on the, on the graph on the, on the right-hand side. We currently have about 1,800 public digital e-services available. Since uh, 2003, you see the, the range of evolution. They are provided by about 1,000 mostly public institutions. There are about 3,000 public institutions altogether in Estonia, depending on how you count. So there is clearly, I mean, we haven't reached uh, um, uh, the ceiling at the moment. And most importantly, and this I think is the key to our uh, discussions today, is we have about 250 state-owned registries that store, gather, and allow the data and allow the provision of public digital uh, services. This is the pool of evidence at the same time. We usually treat these registries as an enabler of designing public digital services. But at the same time, while offering those services, we also here store data that can be used as evidence for the next uh, political uh, for next political uh, decisions. As a reference, you also see here on the left side the amount of queries, interactions, that are happening within the ecosystem of uh, e-government. In 2016 and 15, we had about 600 million interactions uh, per year. That is about 1.6... Oh, this is interesting. This is some kind of a cognitive uh, puzzle for you to be solved. So there are about 1.6 million queries per day in a population of 1.3 million. So the estimated time saved is about 5,700 human 
years if you assume that every interaction uh, 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 takes about 15 minutes from both the interacting parties, the individual and the government uh, official. So this is the effect of, uh, of our, of our e-government. Now why is this relevant? <clears throat> I hope that you're, you're seeing uh, our e-government ecosystem the way I have always seen it. Not so, not so much as a means to provide uh, services to the, to the public, which is its primary and ought to be and should be its, uh, its first and foremost uh, um, uh, objective. But at the same time, we do sense through our e-government what's going on in the population. We gather data and sometimes, I mean we're very good up until to this point, and only sometimes, very rarely, we actually use those data for analytical inferences. Hardly ever we use the, the, it such that we understand the mechanisms, we understand the phenomena that we ought to be understanding, and we very rarely turn it into knowledge, decision. But here we do, uh, again, very well, because, I mean, policy is something that we always do, oftentimes irrespective of the evidence and the data. So this is now uh, a clear uh, <coughs> gap. You see, we have, we have something here and we have something here. Now the question is, how do we fill in the intermediate steps? And now I'm going to walk you through two examples to, in a pretty dramatic format, to show you what are the kind of options that we miss out as a, as a government, as a country, um, as researchers, as politicians, as, um, uh, as government officials, and so on. This is a picture taken last year. What do you think is the time gap between these two um, pictures? Six months. This is March 30th, 11 a.m. This is March 31st, 8 a.m. Coming from uh, picture coming from uh, the road connecting Tartu and, uh, and uh, Tallinn. I had somebody taken it, I didn't take it myself. The sharp change in conditions, in road conditions, leads oftentimes in Estonia to what we call a multi-car collisions, and uh, uh, traffic accidents are uh, in Estonia a common thing. We have a very high rate of uh, um, uh, 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 lethal accidents uh, on roads, and this is something that we really need to be worried about. About 100. Uh, people per year die in car uh, accidents. At the same time, there's a lovely summer picture from in the eastern part of Estonia, and it's not because there is a nice windmill, but at the same time, if you look at this pole, there are some gadgets attached to this uh, pole. These are what uh, the road administration office calls the smart road sensors. And they store about, depending on the setup of, of those sensors, about 10 to 20 um, uh, variables in real time on road conditions across the country. Not everywhere, but across the country in all of the main roads. We are currently, actually I'm tired of saying that, we have been for the past two years working toward the solution a scientific solution, how to pull those data together, the smart road sensory data, the weather data, which is important, the contextual data, the calendar, whether there is a, a Midsummer's Day uh, or whether there is a 1st of May uh, in the eastern part of Estonia, and most importantly, the rescue board data that records actual accidents. In order to do what? Well, that's pretty self-evident, isn't it? To predict the traffic accidents ahead of their actual happening. And if we can do that, and our preliminary models show that there is a fair accuracy in those models, 
If we are able to do that, we can use those data for resource allocation to send police, police cars to calm the traffic or prepare the medical uh, equipment uh, if um, um, uh, uh, prediction scores go through some of the thresholds. We can use this information as an input for smart traffic signs, which is a much cheaper way than extending uh, the roads. And we can signal drivers via mobile alerts, via handheld uh, devices. This technology is ready. We need to extend it to the TRL le level uh, 8 to 9. There are clear stakeholders. We know how much it costs. The funding is there from EU structural funds. We've been applying, we've been trying to put together the project for the past two years, and we haven't progressed a bit. That's a gap. And this is not because somebody is evil and doesn't want to do things, but because it's cumbersome. I'll stop here for the, for the moment to, to walk you through another example, which is equally relevant, I think. In this case, those both, both uh, examples come from my research group. That's why I wanted to start, not as an administrator, but as a, as a researcher. We worked with the mandate from, uh, from the Ministry of um, Communications and um, uh, Economy, on a project called um, Economy in Real Time. As it happens, in Estonia, you have about 166,000 companies declaring their taxes on a monthly basis. Um, and, that, and those data are comparable across a very long uh, time span, uh, from 2002. We had a mandate to use those data from the Tax and Customs Board, and pilot what we can, what can be do, uh, what can be done with those data. First, we built the dashboard, a real-time dashboard of Estonian economy. Some KPIs: what's the total sales uh, per uh, employee, the total uh, uh, turnover, the total uh, profit, and it's a prototype. You can, you can play around with it. You can say, okay, I want to see this sector in this region. Uh, uh, and you can, you can browse through all kinds of uh, indicators that we record in corporate tax declarations. You see the size of the economy. How large is the wholesale? How large is the uh, manufacturing? And so on and so forth. This information is never available to public. This information is available to the ministries, central bank, ministry of finance, tax and customs board, although they don't aggregate it the same way. But hey, this information ought to be available in secondary schools. My son is 15. He wants to play around and understand how the economy works, right? And there's nothing compromising in, in here. Why don't, we, why don't we make it public? This is the democratization of the data. We can look at the time series. What is the total sales of all companies? What is the impact of 2009 CDO crisis on Estonian economy? All kinds of funny things you can look at. You can look at the um, uh, job market uh, composition, Employ uh, the, the age distribution of, uh, of employed people, uh, the gender distribution in one sector comparing it to the entire economy. You can look at in real time to the gender wage gap. An important issue. No analysis needed. You can do that all. You can do a more complex stuff. You can use machine learning for real time uh, economic forecasting, which currently the Ministry of Finance does by hand. Their, their, their team of analysts, which are talented and great people. And they, should, they ought to be liberated from those technical tasks. They, they better do something more meaningful and let the machine do something using sophisticated ensemble learning techniques to produce the scores, the prediction scores, where the economy is going. This in particular here is manufacturing. We have experimental tools for impact analysis. What is the chances of giving an export support from Enterprise Estonia to this particular company. What would be the uh, predicted 
uh, uh, net turnover of that company with or without the export tuition. That's evidence-based policymaking, to, to the best of my understanding. Do we use it? Yes, in our laboratory, but not in Enterprise Estonia. <clears throat> Here's the simplest example of the same data. Take John's factory, uh, John's furniture factory somewhere in Vuruma, in, south, uh, in southern Estonia. It's a company where the owner from its accounting an accountant knows exactly what are its KPIs, the turnover, growth, turnover per employee, and added value. Why don't we... And, and John, for his company, every month gives us the declarations, gives information to the government. Why doesn't the government give information back to John, which is very easy to calculate, to compute? John's turnover and the comparison to the likes of him, the likes of, of, of companies, not the sector, but, the, but the, really the, the companies that are similar to him. And then he knows that he is actually smaller than the average company. He grows quicker, but his added value is lower. And that will translate, believe me, into managerial decisions. If we feed this information back, that's also evidence-based intervention into private sector. This is ready in our laboratory. This is at level 9 or even 10, if 10 would exist. The ministries are there, the, the stakeholders are there, the funding is completed, we need another perhaps a million uh, to get it airborne. Why it's not there? Again, the same as with the, with the traffic accident prediction. Not because people are, are, are lazy or, uh, or, or uh, ill-minded, no. There is a gap in how we bridge, how, how we bridge um, the laboratory-ready solutions into real life. We have, just in our, in our research team, similar pilots available for prediction of domestic fires, which is a hugely important uh, uh, pro uh, problem. Predictive medicine for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, crime and prevention, the occurrence of crime, and we're currently working with unemployment office to predict long-term unemployment and how to develop policies to um, counter that. If I were to look across my entire university, then we would come out with a sack of such almost ready but not on the market solutions. And if Renault would go and look in TTU, in Taltec, he would come up with, uh, with, uh, with an equal amount of, of solutions that are ready in laboratories. And, not, and this is a potential that we haven't uh, properly used. So we sense the world out there. We have the data. We have skills how to make analytical inferences. We understand the mechanisms. We have the knowledge. We can translate it into meaningful. What Dharma is always saying, that it needs to be packaged and and the, the message needs to be, we, we have that knowledge in universities. But we're missing the decision and the policy on those areas. So what is missing? I think uh, we need to, uh, and now I'm going to put, use, you know, change the hat and, and, and talk more like a science administrator. <clears throat> but I think we need to look at the typical policy cycle. I mean, this is an idealized understanding of how, of how policies are com comprised. Often they don't work uh, uh, using this cycle, but sometimes they do. More often than not, I would say they do. So it always starts with, 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 with setting the agenda, because there is always, I mean, you have politics for policies. I mean, that's the entire logic. So you need to have an agenda setting, go through the analysis and choices, you debate the policies, you apply something, gather, gather feedback, uh, go through the impact analysis, and you basically repeat it. It's an ongoing process. So why are we not able to bridge this gap from laboratories to the policy cycle? I would highlight two things, like these two gear uh, wheels, gears that you see here. 
they are not in synchronicity, right? I mean, you see, I mean, visually, I mean, they won't, it, does, it, it wouldn't turn, right? There is a lack of synchronicity of two things, of time, we researchers and the government has very different understanding of time. And the second, there is a lack of synchronicity in expectations. What we think that we can deliver oftentimes differs from what the government official or the politician requires. There are, two, there are many, many more, but I think these are, from, from, from our point of view, the two most important uh, expectations uh, or uh, uh, kind of missing, missing gaps. So in terms of expe expectations, what you need to have is a common challenge. And this is how we tried to address all our research problems. You need to have a common challenge. You as a researcher and the data donor and the government uh, department that, is, that would be interested in, uh, in applying the thing and turning into the policy. You need to understand, for example, that the challenge is that 100 people die in car accidents per, per year. This is a challenge. If it's not mutually understood, well, there, it's very difficult to, to move ahead. You need to understand that there is the same amount of domestic fires here in Estonia than in Scandinavia, but four times more people die in those. It's a problem. It can be translated into a meaningful policy challenge, right? And there needs to be a scientific applied solution to that, that we can prove on an evidence basis that we have a prototype. And, and I think this is the most important lesson for, for me. You need to be able to produce not only the paper, the regression coefficient published, but you need to demonstrate the prototype, that this is how it would be developed or deployed uh, if it were to be uh, deployed eventually. And you need to test it, and you need, to, you need to show how this is going to work. And the second, and I'm going to end with that, is the lack of time synchronicity. And I'm going to look only at the broad picture. So if we look at the, and it's surprising how little we as researchers are actually aware of it. Uh, if you look at the fiscal year budget process from January to, to uh, December, then there are two important events at the governmental level. The, the state budget strategy in March or April, in, in April depending on, on of the year, and then the state budget uh, uh, bill that is on the floor in the parliament, usually in October. Again, sometimes it, uh, it depends. The discussion, the density of discussions always repeats from year to year, and we as researchers oftentimes fail to understand it and to follow it, okay? And we have to use all our you know, tools in, in, the, in the classical agenda setting for coalition building, stakeholder convincing, op-eds in media, if we want to get things true, through. I think it's our responsibility. Some say, well, it's government's responsibility. We are there sitting in our laboratories with all our fancy solutions to, all the cure, to, to cure most of the challenges in the society. Let the politicians come to us. I think it's really our challenge to go and, and sell them, to make them aware that they're, they're actually there and make them aware in a timely fashion because it's completely useless in midsummer's day or, uh, or after, the, after the budget, when there is the longest span to the next, uh, next talk. It's completely useless, right? And yet, we do that oftentimes. <laughs> so I would argue that you need to focus just a couple of weeks, a month ahead, and better yet, a full year ahead of the whole cycle, so that people can um, accept your plans and time the density of your discussions just ahead of uh, uh, that. And with that, I think if we can cure the synchronicity in expectations and in time with the solutions that we already have anyway in our laboratories, then we get the flyby or the, or the, or the gearbox uh, moving in a more synchronous fashion. And ultimately, I really believe that we can turn this society into an evidence-based society.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, there is plenty of time for questions. Please, is anybody wanting to ask? Go ahead. Um, of, or of the story was correct. Actually, for uh, researchers or lobby makers, there is only one week or two, one period per year. Forget about October. Concentrate on March. <laughs> okay. Thank you for this uh, presentation. It's, uh, I'm happy to see that uh, there is uh, something that we planned uh, some uh, many years ago uh, really taking place here in Estonia. I was involved as uh, I will, uh, I'm, ah, by the way, I'm Mario Paolucci from Italy because I don't think that people here know me. We were involved in this large scale project that was called Future ICT, which really hoped to create some of the things that you're showing here now. And uh, we had all the part of censorship that we wanted to introduce at the European level. Probably Estonia is, uh, is really arriving there. So on, one, on the one hand, I'm really glad to see that several of things that we've thought uh, you're really doing it, them. On the, on the other hand, I had a couple of worries. I, I wonder if you want to elaborate on them. And the first one, it was uh, pretty obvious. Uh, you didn't mention privacy at all. Some people could see these as the, the, uh, comparable to the social, uh, the, uh, it's not even real, but the social score that they're, they're developing in China, or at least that some papers say they are. So the, that level of information worries me in, from several points of view. Uh, there is some research, I mean, uh, Tim Berners-Lee himself is proposing now system, systems to uh, decouple uh, the data from the storage and uh, maintain a personal ownership of data. So first question was if you're uh, working on this. And the second uh, question is about the synchronization, uh, the, not the time one, but the other one. What do you mean exactly? And uh, I mean, research, uh, is, uh, I, at least uh, I have the opinion that one of the key points of research is having the freedom to fail. And that's something that policy instead should try to avoid as much as possible. So if you uh, think that you can connect those two points uh, with uh, leaving most of the responsibility to the researcher, you're stealing something from the nature of the researcher himself because he will uh, become uh, too much focused on uh, doing something that delivers. Even in the, uh, the range of your examples, you moved from things that are, uh, I mean, from things that are logically are bound to success because the system for uh, road uh, weather detection should be working. I can't find any logical reason why not. The for forecasting the economy with machine learning systems has several points of potential failure and is theoretically much more complicated. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, when we started with the real-time economy project, then non, no uh, trained economist um, wanted to join uh, yeah. the project. Uh, we are a bunch of political scientists. And it took us uh, a bit of convincing uh, to at least try. Let, let's try. Let's fail. So for each success that we have in these prototypes, we have, uh, we have about 10 failures. So I'm very familiar and, and very uh, fond of failures uh, in that respect. I think the idea, I mean, these are really already TRL level, you know, four, five, and, and, uh, and up. Um, the failures or should happen at the more fundamental level, or if they happen at the at the at the applied level, then they simply don't get to the policy makers. So I think it's it's fine, but but we need to test and try. Regarding privacy, um, privacy is very strongly bound to the kind of uh, kind of woven in to the to the very fabric of our e-government. So so it's inherently already there. Regarding to what you refer as, the, as the, the, the China syndrome, for example, is something that I think 
and it may sound a little bit blunt or maybe even banal, is that researchers should not be very much worried about privacy at the prototyping level. If the question is, for example, predicting type 2 diabetes ahead of the first symptoms, because there, it's a huge impact on people's lives, or for example, traffic accidents. If we can figure out the way how to uh, predict accidents and um, intervene successfully, then I think it's the second level where we have to assess whether privacy concerns are met, whether data is handled uh, um, uh, appropriately and res responsibly and so on. But as a curiosity, I think if we start with, with, with privacy and all kinds of other hurdles and barriers, then we, uh, we basically suffocate under those. Uh, and that drives the curiosity-based prototyping uh, into dead-end uh, road. I am interested in your understanding uh, but the term uh, knowledge because um, some uh, political studies are uh, explained that the technology in science is different uh, in comparison to knowledge in policy making and the question is how to translate the knowledge used in science into applicable knowledge in, 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 in political life. Uh, uh, the purpose is how to get more votes. Well. Maybe Marco, you can even on that answer that better than I do. I think at the government official level, where you really want to make progress in your area of, gov of governance, the translation of resources into seats and votes is much less prevalent. And this is where most of the innovation actually should be kind of driven. So I, I, I don't think that's a bottleneck at the moment. Thank you, Christian. It was a wonderful talk. And I'm Anu Reynard from University of Tartu. And uh, we just uh, start a uh, applied project uh, using satellite data to, to make uh, life in ministries easier so that they could make uh, more clever decisions. And uh, exactly everything that you explained here was something that about I was talking this morning with my husband, who is professor and also chief uh, research and development officer in the company. And uh, I was even waiting, said, what is your like conclusion or where do you reach with all this? Uh, and um, I was surprised that you didn't include enterprises to your talk. So I have actually two questions. Uh, where do you put enterprises? What is their role in, in this scheme? And the second is that you showed the technology readiness level like nine or maybe 10. Is it really this level where we in university or in academy should uh, reach? Should we stay at lower levels and leave our knowledge to the enterprises to, to reach to the higher levels? Well, classically, indeed, I mean, classical approach is that universities should not be engaged in, in technologies that are at such high level of readiness. But my concern is not structuring uh, the university at the moment, but how to translate the evidence and the, the capacity that we have in the university in this particular time, in this particular country, into actionable policies. And this is clearly maybe we, we, we can achieve that within the next 10 years and then there's, there comes a tech transfer office or, or a bunch of companies that do that. But at the moment, we're, we're missing. We don't have so kind of knowledge intensive or tech intensive uh, companies at the moment. So there is, a, there is a gap. I did focus on universities because I know that we have, as you have in your institute, as, as Taltec has, as KBFE has, I mean, there's a lot of Kind, these kind of prototypes available that are sitting on a shelf and that should be uh, put into action. That's why I took the university. I don't want to undermine, quite, quite the contrary. Uh, but at the moment, I think the companies, there are a few examples, Miller and being one, that actually are able to, to, to make those uh, important steps. But it's not, they, they haven't scaled up at the moment. Very last question. Yes, okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, 
Academy for arranging this and to express my big sorry that we have only two members of Parliament here. I felt very moving about you. Uh, um, I just how to decrease the amount of uh, victims in traffic 100 around a year because I actually lost my dad when I was a child in traffic uh, accident. But uh, 100 a year, we have actually, uh, there are people here, we have a much, much bigger problem in this country. And this is that over 1,500 people are perishing in Estonia every year. It makes more than 100 a month due to medical mistakes. It's a fact. And we can use uh, data, techniques to save a lot of people when we will implement uh, administration list of drugs doses uh, in this country to use uh, the technology advantage we have and out of those 1,500, it's a big taboo, uh, taboo in this country, out of, of those 1,500, around half could be saved every year uh, when we will implement Western style uh, uh, safety uh, steps and this is exactly if we will end the Soviet area practice to administrate drugs without informed consent. And uh, just to tell you who I am, I am uh, I'm someone whom Estonian government offered uh, a few years ago 60,000 euros to cover up my case with friendly settlement. My son uh, was Falling a victim of very horrible crime in Estonian hospital. I'm a lifelong journalist. I have dedicated my life to this issue. So, kind of no questions, by it, but a very big plea to academy, to scientists. If you have any chance to help us, please do. Thank you. Thank you. We have to move on. Uh, the next speaker is <coughs> Marco Pomerantz, as uh, chair of the uh, Constitutional Committee of Estonian Parliament and uh, former minister, as we all know. Please. Good afternoon. I welcome everybody who is in the room. And the list is the same as President uh, Darmus Omer had. Everybody who is high and lower rank, you are welcomed. Now, uh, I think that we start to repeat each other, but I think it's good because maybe uh, those bottlenecks or key points are uh, similar. Uh, and if you can solve some problems, it's good enough. I apologize that maybe it happens that uh, you can't understand all what I want to express or say, because um, English is not my mother's tongue, but it might happen even in Estonian language that uh, people can't understand you. I bring you one example. I visited one nice restaurant in Rakvare, Sarvik. I recommend it for everybody. And I asked a bladder of cheese for appetizer. But I got various oysters, pull eggs with beet root leaves. So things might happen. Sain pullimune, just asemel. But now to the topic. Last year I wrote a book, my ministries. For foreigners, I must say that I have been a Minister of Social Affairs, Internal and Environment. And here is a whole story about that, how government and politicians are working and uh, how, what about the uh, budget process in Estonia. And the truth is that concentrate on March, uh, October is already too late, nothing to do uh, in October. And, um, I 
made one uh, suitability test for young ministers, and there are 14 different points. And one of my requirements um, is like that you should have some kind of bachelor degree at least, so the people won't bad mouth you as they please. In the 90s, it wasn't so important at all. We have reform time. Um, we have such a former minister as Kaido Gama, man who studied forestry in in middle of Estonia, and he was a minister of justice. Good one. Everybody can tell it. But today, if young minister goes to the ministry, he met at least five, six persons with doctoral degree. And it means you should have at least something. And maybe it's just good start to understand what the word science means at all. They say that um, good dancer is not disturbed by music. This probably also holds true for the relationship between a minister and science. So science does not necessarily disturb a minister. It should, of course, at least from time to time. Why don't the message of scientists reach politicians? Or why do they never come to ask an answer, advice? There might be many reasons. I suppose sometimes politicians solve problems that don't even exist. How can science help there? One such, one such example is introducing free public transportation, for example. Yeah, it was said already that um, scientists and politicians live in different time zones, as to officials, by the way, incidentally. Politicians are in hurry. Scientists and officials are not. Officials and scientists um, may have time to analyze the collected responses by Christmas. Not for this Christmas, but the next year Christmas. Minister never has such a time. A politician only has a few months in, uh, to reinforce their plans with ideas and content. I give you two examples. The first one is not linked to the science so much, but uh, it tells you what about time in politics. The legal amendments uh, that came into force this year allow the police to apply alternative proceedings for lesser misdemeanors, which saves time for the police and reduces excessive criminalization. Alternative proceedings are uh, applied to 20 lesser misdemeanors, mostly traffic-related. In the future, those 20 misdemeanors will occur as a sanctioning fine without, with an amount that is determined specifically in, for every misdemeanor. While today, the misdemeanor procedure takes about 20 minutes. Alternative proceedings will shorten it to nearly five minutes. When I was Minister of Internal Affairs from 2009 to 2011, I knew that it's somewhere behind the corner. It comes very soon. Now we have 2019. And it's not nuclear science. It's actually a small piece of uh, legislation. Second example. In Estonia, we talk about gender pay cap. Politicians, especially social democrats, consider that as an important topic in their program. Everyone should, but um, social democrats definitely have their, it's in their political agenda. Women organize women's marches. There is even a relevant draft act currently in the parliament. At the same time, on the 18th of January 2019, breakfast show of Estonian national TV channel, Marga Hund, professor of comparative sociology in Tallinn University, looked pleased to announce that we now 
had the opportunity to carry out a three years project to study the nature of the cap. Because we are unable to explain 85% of it, so we can expect some mat um, uh, material for the 2023 elections promises. Poli some politicians and officials are promising to solve the problem today. Actually, we have campaigning time, and it's the reason why most of uh, parliamentarians are somewhere outside uh, in front of uh, marketplaces. So, about um, different languages. Scientists and politicians speak a different language. Messages are too complicated. Sometimes it feels that people don't even want to say the solution out loud. This reminds me the legal analysis of the possibilities of ethnic Estonians in Abkhazia to opt the um, Estonian citizenship. There are also positive examples that are based on experiences. After all, experts are the people who know some answers without three years of research. The president of Estonian Academy of Sciences, Tarmo Sommer, was asked, how would the two small harbors in small Casmo Bay affect the local ecosystems? The service area of the bay is about 15 square kilometers, Distance between two ports or harbors is four, are four kilometers. Water column is six, eight meters in, in average. And um, both small harbors are for 50 sailing boats. I quote an article by Sommer in the 12th April 2017, issue for regional newspaper, Virma Diata, my home newspaper. And now, Tarmo Sommer, it's kind of like being bitten by two mosquitoes instead of one, considering the size of the two harbors and self-cleaning ability of the sea. These will not significantly affect the functioning of the bay. Clear. Scientists must give a clear, articulate, and thoughtfully presented recommendations, not descriptions of the general nature of problem or a collection of facts. But, you know, a coin has always two sides. So, politicians and officials must ask the right and clearly defined questions to achieve concrete objectives and solve problems, instead of approaching scientists with vague wish lists so with concentrated objectives remain either unclear or unreasonable. After all, we are also expected to be able to answer yes or no questions. It was recently asked in TV show from me. I preferred Trump or Obama and next Trump or Putin. Two short answers, nothing to debate. There are times when you should not look towards politicians or ask them questions like, what do you think? Sometimes don't ask from politicians. And um, I bring you some examples. Estonian one. Some background for our foreign guests. Um, Estonia is discussing uh, right now about uh, uh, plan of activities in Estonian forestry for next uh, 10 years. And the main focus is how much we could, can cut uh, uh, forest uh, in one year. And uh, the question is about the basic um, information, and we have such a thing in Estonia as Estonian Statistical Forest Inventory. Scientific data, scientific methodology, and there are still proposals. Maybe, what do you think? Maybe we should discount a, a Wurzjärv lake uh, from that area. It's the largest inland uh, lake in Estonia. Or maybe we should uh, count a forest uh, land uh, somehow in another way, start from trees which are maybe 1.3 meters high or something else. Please, count how you want. No need to ask from uh, public opinion because it's a scientific issue. And then we can add as politicians our attitude 
Okay, scientifically is like 10 million or 6 million cubic meters per year, but here is great cultural value and we take 2 million down. But before that, science should talk. So, there are topics where scientists themselves disagree, and it can indeed happen. I remember the drama a couple of years ago when Estonian University of Life Sciences, University of Tartu and Tallinn University of Technology signed the Agreement of Good Research Practices that regulates competent professional support by, new, by universities for developing large-scale projects planned in Estonia. This caused discussion on muscling. Actually, it's fine for every institution to have its own opinion. When the Supreme Court made its decision, by the way, Estonian Supreme Court got today a new chairman, Ilukova, no one was against, 65 pro. Uh, when the Supreme Court makes its decision, the dissenting opinions are recorded, and yet the decision is made regardless. And I think so it should be about scientists also. Attitude towards climate change and response to this is clearly a topic that may, many find hard to grasp, especially from the point of view of Estonian role in this. We will also discuss cl climate change today. Member of the Academy, geologist Anto Raukas and President of the Academy, Tarmo Somere, have two completely different approaches. How could we then ever assume that politicians are somehow united and their empathy and trust into save the planet? Never happens. The platform and means to spreading the message. If you want to impart your knowledge to politicians, choose a tabloid or weekly newspaper instead of high pro cultural newspaper. Member of the Academy, Ulon Inemets, published his fourth article on Monsanto documents on the use of panning of glyphosates in the 11th of January issue of the national cultural paper, SIRP. There had been three other installments before that. And why not? The paper even has a scientific uh, column. He refers to final newspaper from uh, 9th July 2016, where the submitters of petition on banning glyphosate claimed that the Rural Affairs Committee of the Rigigogo, our parliament, had absolutely no idea of the scientific research done on glyphosates. It's for nothing that the petitioners had not submitted their data either. Also, they did promise to. Members of the parliaments might lack understanding on great many things that are straightforward for specialists. Here is a recommendation to those scientists who worry about the fate of Estonia. Allow yourself to be involved and involve each other. Financial resources. One clear problem is skipping on commissioning the relevant impact assessment. Ministries who are experienced in commissioning scientific studies and do it habitually have already made their working plans, drafted their budgets, and new minister who will likely take over in April will have two options. Either try to change the situation or go along with the rhythm of the ministry. This is probably huge, where the huge store is buried. Scientists in politics sometimes becoming ministers. There are historical examples. Thomas Frey, Jaak Aviksu, Toivo Maimets, Andres Tarant has even served as a prime minister. And I would even add Andrus Anzip to the list because his chemistry studies definitely helped him make sense of the world. If I talk about scientists in politics, then their main plus is their educational base, having the big picture. Physicist and Minister of Defense, Jakovicsu, 
made an excellent spokesperson during the Bronze Night in 2007. And thanks to his argumentation and language skills. Sociologist Aare Kasemets, presenting here, has been studying the movements towards knowledge-based policy and legislation for years. He offers five political suggestions in his uh, analysis, which was, uh, was published in 2016 in issue number 34, Riigi publication of the parliament. And what he proposed, the legislative work plan of the government is tied to monitoring plans of ministries, application studies, impact analysis, working plans on inclusion of interest groups. It is time to analyze and update the content of rules of good legislation practice and legislation drafting from 2011 and the impact assessment methodology. I tell you, you never reach a situation where you have such an impact assessment which is sufficient. It never happens. You can make some forms and say, environmental impacts are somehow assessed, economical side true, regional development side also, but you can't never say that you have enough information. What is good? If you make a new law, it often happens that you have possibility for amendments or improvements and uh, there are not lives every day behind uh, some kind of uh, law. And I think uh, if we talk about the uh, future uh, of uh, better communication between scientists and politicians, then fine-tuning is not the case by my understanding at least. But we have also good examples, and I bring them from the Ministry of Environment. The managing recommendations concerning Baltic sprout, herring, cod and salmon stocks are developed together with Estonian specialists for fish stocks, for example. A cooperation in Helcom system uh, is one example where Estonian and other scientists uh, around Baltic Sea are involved, or Estonian Russia, Trans uh, Russia Transboundary Water Commission as a good example. And I talked about forestry, where we have uh, most uh, public debates today, or they come at least. Researchers have been commissioned uh, to a new basic study uh, for drafting the new forestry development plan, and of course, uh, discussions between them, they stay. Conclusions. Solutions lie first and foremost in changing attitudes and less in fine-tuning rules of legislative drafting. I believe that we should refrain from legislative and making changes, deregulate if possible, trust the officials, I mean uh, officials who should implement laws, because somehow we want to prescript everything for them and we can reach uh, to to a situation when, when machinery makes or computers make all decisions instead of uh, specialists. The officials led by Secretary General of the Ministry should be ready to pro procure the impact assessments, assessments for planned activities after the elections. Sometimes also when the minister is not interested. That would be a professional thing to do. The minister can join the drafting, uh, drafting of an act starting at the description of the idea. The last moment for getting on board is just before the first reading of the draft act is in parliamentary pl pl plenary hall. For important questions, only the first option is true. If the field suffers from so-called scientific problem, you should communicate with involved parties. I talk about ministers. Keep your schedule fairly uncluttered to have time to think uh, about the great things and great picture and the things to do. And last now for researchers. 
never pick rude or condescending towards politicians. It's difficult to expect to be heard when you have been condescending. This also works another way around. It was for a start. Thank you. Cooling down uh, uh, speech. Uh, maybe we will have time for one short question, please. I don't see, so instead. We are approaching our last talk before the coffee break. And this is uh, from uh, Mr. Villar Luby, uh, who is with uh, Minister of Economics Affairs and Communications. Please. Thank you. Actually, if you don't mind, I also take the standing position. Um, my name is Villar Luby. I am a Deputy Secretary General for Economic Development in the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Uh, thank you so much for the invite. I think it's very timely as well. Uh, those who don't know me, it's a bad thing, but I promise you will start to know me soon, because um, the topic at hand is extremely crucial at this point. And the uh, uh, Ministry of Economy, in a way, gave up the topic a few years back, and I think it was a very wrong decision. But now, and I will argue also that maybe the timing is right as well, we, we, we take the, let's say, the stronger hand again, and we're building innovation, let's say, capabilities also in the, in the ministry and also in our executive bodies. So that definitely it has been a very high up in my agenda for the last year or at least a few months for sure. Uh, I've been traveling for the last few weeks so that I don't have a well-prepared uh, speech, so it's more like a collection of some ideas. So I hope you don't mind if I check my notes every now and then. Uh, I want you to mention a few key words that I find important and then try to link them somehow. I start with uh, one very important aspect, and it's called risk-taking. Um, I think it's extremely uh, important uh, question. Because uh, quite often we need to uh, decide if I want to walk the path we already know or I want to take something absolutely new and discover something new as well. And it happens everywhere. It's an ex extremely important question in the in, uh, in, uh, private sector, for example. Uh, do you go for disruptive ideas? Or you just, you know, if you take, you know, where to develop further, you just go for digitalization, automatization. That is more like the efficiency road, not the innovation road. The same also in, uh, in policy making. The best example probably is that e-residency e is a good example that it was not to make the government more efficient, but to try something completely new. Uh, and also, if you take science, I don't go, it's, it's not my field of expertise, but science as well. And, and I like always the example that most Nobel Prizes have been uh, won or research that is actually going exactly off track, that is not used before, so that also this kind of taking a risk is extremely important. Talking to uh, mostly uh, the sci scientists here, so I know also, I remember from my university years, that everything you, you say or do, you have to put it in a theoretical framework. So I try to do that as well, and I hope you don't mind if I I actually read it out, and I, I want to quote one, uh, one research paper, and do excuse if I pronounce the names from, wrong, but these are, the authors are Preci, Malerba, and Orzenigo, and the title is Technological Regimes and Schumpeterian Patterns of Innovation. And what it says, I want to quote, is that that specific pattern of uh, innovative activities in, in an industry can be explained as the outcome of different technological uh, uh, learning regimes. There are two main patterns of innovation in industry. 
industries. The first one is a creative destruction pattern, where in innovations are introduced by firms that did not innovate before. It's called widening. The second one is a creative accumulation pattern, where innovations are introduced by firms that innovated before. It is called deepening. The basic difference in the ways innovative activities are structured and organized may be related to the fundamental distinction between uh, Schumpeter Mark I and Schumpeter Mark II industries. The Mark I pattern deepening is associated positively to the concentration ratio of the top four patenting firms and to the stability of the hierarchy of innovators, and negatively to the share of patent applications applying for the first time in a certain period. The Mark I pattern widening is the opposite. I, I definitely will come back to this, but this is probably a bit of a theoretical framework. I, I want to structure my, my examples. So, how about the practice? Uh, my job is to make Estonia a better place to do business, and my, let's say my only target to simplify is economic growth. Not economic growth per se, but also how the, let's say, productivity increases and more added value. That's extremely important. That's my only, let's say, target. Um, and what is the big, let's say, drawback right now? It's um, we have lack of people. So that right now we have a good problem that uh, the labor market cannot, uh, cannot provide enough uh, workforce for economy to grow. Um, but everything can change if we have next global economic crisis. Most probably we have a negative problem, meaning that we have a big un unemployment. So that things can change very fast, but currently we have, I call it positive problem, uh, lack of labor. As I said, our targets are set. The, uh, uh, our economic program says that our target for the 2020, we have two main targets. One is employment rate. It should be 76%. We already achieved that. It's 78. So probably don't no much uh, room to go further. Second one is if you have the productivity level, it should be 80% of EU average. We haven't achieved that yet. Right now, economy as a whole is about 74, 75%. But in industry, it's only 55. It's very, very low. And now, if you th think that you know you have a salary pressure. Uh, then uh, they say that, especially in the globalized world, the price of the capital is the same for everybody. So only the way forward is innovation, nothing else in this situation. Uh, but now, as I said about practical examples, is that uh, what is the main problem of the industry? We don't have companies like Apple. Apple says this phone costs you 1,000 euros. If you don't like it, don't buy it. Our industry is mostly about we are price takers, meaning that you know, we cannot manipulate the price. We cannot push it further up. So the price is given to us. We just have to match and see if we can keep our cost low enough in order to be uh, competitive. Now the thing is that uh, companies could invest. I tell them, especially as we have labor shortages, invest in the machines, digitalize, automate, lay of people. They don't do it. There is a very simple economic reason and it's very difficult to argue. And I also want to make the point that if you have a cool scientific, let's say, idea, how to convince them to do otherwise, do let me know. That's the point also why I'm here. Uh, and we can discuss it further also if you join uh, the working group I'm, I'm uh, chairing and also I will be here today. So I'm uh, also, I, used the opportunity to say that I'm here the whole day today, I can't be here tomorrow and day after tomorrow. So I tell them, buy machines, lay of people. They say, I won't do it. Why? Because they're price takers. They say, maybe I can foresee my demand for the next year or two. That's it. If demand drops, let's say a new crisis hits, I can fire people like that. It gives me flexibility. If I buy an expensive machine, so maybe it gives you some efficiency gains, but you pay the lease for the next seven, eight years. The demand drops two years from now, you still pay the lease. If you have labor-intensive industry, you lay off people. It gives you flexibility. Very difficult to argue against. 
it's, uh, this is also related to risk taking. That you have to take the risk, otherwise it's very difficult. So this, uh, this brings me to this 1% that was already mentioned before. That political leaders decided that the public investments in R&D and innovation should reach 1% of GDP. And I think it's very, very important. And I think, you know, that also when science should, should get the extra money because, you know, they should get the good conditions to do their research and should be also compensated uh, according to their uh, standards and also position. I think it's extremely, extremely important. Supply side, I would argue also, supply side is there. We can find unit or it do it even stronger, but it's there and it's functioning. The problem we argue is that demand side is not functioning. What I mean by that, it's mostly the economy, the enterprises. So that in, in economy, it always should be supply and demand. Right now, supply side is that the scientific research is there, but there is no much economic from economic side who uses the science. And this is what I think we should target more. I don't say that we should open up completely, but at least part of it. We should open, widen it. Right now, there is no marketplace where supply and demand can meet in Estonia, or it's very, very limited. And I think working together, we can really uh, change that. We, it, it was also mentioned before, somebody said that, but uh, as a government, we tell companies, it's okay to fail. Try, fail, try, fail. And somebody said correctly, governments cannot fail. It's a big problem that we, we cannot fail and uh, why it's important as well. And scientists, I just wonder, somebody said yes. Dr. Vasi said uh, scientists can fail, but I also argue that, you know, yes, you can fail. If you take a stone example, it's very okay to fail if you are in the protective walls of the academia. But if you bring people outside, that they're more exposed to market forces, then probably the emotional it's more difficult. Because, you know, in a way, you have to manage the failure in the market conditions. And it's completely different. Because you try to commercialize something, you fail. Actually, you, you really suffer some, uh, some revenue, uh, let's say loss, or costs. But in academia, more, you know, you uh, try one, you take another grant, and you try on and try on. So that this kind of, you know, risk taking is extremely important. Um, so that we, uh, we need to take more risk, we need to be exposed more to the market. And so if we can get more PhD students or post-PhD people to try, try out how it is to work on the market, to be exposed to market conditions. It is difficult right now. Also, the thing is what I said about demand side, that companies, not, companies are not ready. We need to help them. Because, you know, there are not so many scientists that have entrepreneurial spirit so that, you know, he or she can combine both sides, scientific side and also entrepreneurial side. I've been uh, speaking to people like young, you know, successful business people, former scientists of both, like Evgeny Gabanov, or Mike Muntel, who really tried to use their knowledge and made also a very successful business. But we don't have too many of that. We need to create a marketplace, maybe bring competence in also, initially, from abroad. But so that we, what uh, Professor Sommer has said all the time, we need to provide them so that the bridges are created, that bring those more, let's say, applied studies oriented scientists out of the academia and put them together with uh, business leaders who really see and understand the science behind it and what kind of p potential commercial value this knowledge has. This is definitely lacking. Uh, because, you know, the problem is very much so, and I don't say it because it's mostly science, scientists here, the eco economic problem is the, uh, the quality of management that our business leaders, they don't have the understanding so well how they should, you know, proceed. Because, you know, what brought us here doesn't uh, take us any further. 
and this kind of you know knowledge is missing. Business models are outdated. We need to change them. And again, you know, if you take the practical example, very difficult uh, to argue against. Uh, again, take the industry. Of course, it's simplification. I have to warn you, it's not scientifically proved. But the problem is that ambition is not there. Why ambition, ambition is not there? Because 25 years ago, when uh, then those you know, young, mostly guys, in their late 30s, maybe mid 30s, early 40s, took all the risk, invested everything they had, mostly the outsourcing business. Took all the risk and succeeded. Now, 25 years later, after the salary pressure, those business models don't work again. They had to change that, they had to risk again, choose everything completely different, we tell them risk again. Now they're in the late 50s, the early 60s. They have a nice villa in VMC. They, uh, uh, grandkids go to good schools. We tell them risk again. They don't do that. They just don't do that. Again, you know, as a, as a let's say, person, I totally understand the instinct that it's very, very difficult. But we have to do it and we need to see what government can do. So, uh, what I said about, uh, let's say, open-minded scientists, like most scientists are, meeting the market. Um, another maybe key word I want to say is mobility. This what we see is a, is a big shortcoming and we, we need to do. How to increase the mobility between academia and, and, and uh, uh, business? It's very, very important. Uh, we, uh, we need to open up because if you ask the companies, they say we don't have the knowledge but maybe in certain conditions we are ready to employ scientists. So if we can uh, facilitate that, it's great. Probably it's costly initially, but I think this is the path we need to take. Because innovation otherwise, as an economy, will be in big trouble anyway. So one option is always what I say, if you don't have ambition yourself, and that's why also uh, in my other hat, attracting investments, I'm very big supporter of FDI. Sometimes, you know, I'm uh, criticized for that. Why? FDI usually say, you know, there are three things FDI is uh, good for. It brings in capital. It brings in uh, knowledge or know-how. It brings in markets. And the Sona is an ex export-driven uh, country. That's important. But in a way, those three things, we can manage ourselves also. The fourth one, ambition. So that if we right now we don't have ambition, let's import it. And then it Actually, there are scientific researches showing that uh, FTI actually also motivates the local capital. And that's why it's very important. So if we can uh, increase the mobility, I think it's very, very important. Because Estonia is so small society, and we don't have enough people. Even right now, tomorrow, I will meet uh, Anne Suling to see you know, what he has to plan. Maybe you, you all have heard that you know, maybe we should have a separate applied research center in Estonia. For me, it's even not the question of the money, the question of the people, who will work there. Because we don't have enough scientists, meaning if we don't imp import the scientists, so probably some of you need to go there, and so the current employer will lose you. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing. So the mobility is, I think, very important. And in Estonia, we don't have the luxury saying that, you know, people say, these things need to be done. And then we look around, and then we actually realize there's nobody to dedicate this to. You are the person who needs to do that. And this is the, let's say, bad thing or good thing of a small society. So now I come to, now I come to the point what, why the theoretical background. Uh, maybe I, I wanted to say as well, choices. That's the next uh, key word I want to say. Um, so in a small society, we need to make choices. Um, we have... Uh, Thea, how, how your society is, or your organization is called in English, Foresight. 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 We have a Foresight Center. We have a smart sp specialization. We have those. In a way, they give us you know, indications uh, what kind of choices we should or could do. The problem is we don't do them. So we, we study it, we make research, Let's say the findings of research is there, but what you said rightly, decisions don't follow. 
And so the point is, how, how do you overcome this? Um, I also want to argue that, you know, uh, when I've been traveling around, I've also been, you know, I, in my previous life I was a diplomat, so I've really lived in different countries, and they always say, you know, they see that countries say, yes, we see the best practice, we see how other countries operate, but we can't do the same because we are special. I mean, the moment this uh, phrase is said, I think we're doomed. That, you know, why, why do you have benchmarks then, if you're special? You, we are not special. We should learn from other, others uh, and what, what mistakes they have the, uh, made. Um, so, one question I want to leave with, uh, one, uh, let's say, uh, idea uh, I want to uh, leave you with uh, is about the choices and what about, you know, this two options we have, Mark 1 and Mark 2. Uh, also in my portfolio, I have startups, startup Estonia, startups. So uh, what should be a, our approach if we have limited resources, limited ambition, um, and also uh, in a way, let's say, limited avenues to follow what we need? That can you create ambition? Startups are something that, you know, they are very, very ambitious people and they really want to in innovate. If you have an old business model, so can you help the, let's say, the mainstream, uh, mainstream economy or we should pick champions and hope that, you know, what they do, they, they also, they motivate other companies to follow suit. So this is the, the question I always ask myself in the ministry with my innovation team that what is the right approach? Should we spread out all the money thinly? Or actually we pick winners and really let them to be inspiration to others? Um, and my last point is, the more I see even it's, uh, it's a question to academia that in, in this situation, what I very exp explained that, that the businesses, they understand what is necessary, but they don't want to make decisions like the politicians don't. So that what can we do in order to, let's say, prove them that really risk, make make the changes that is necessary. The government is here to support. Also, I add another question without giving any answers, I'm sorry, is that what Dr. Vasil also said about, you know, that we have research proven policy making possible. That one thing that I see in public sector, uh, in my everyday work, as public sector cannot fail, then it means that we analyze and we analyze and we analyze so that it's risk-free. Everybody who has studied economy knows high risk is linked to potentially high revenue. So meaning already if we do everything risk-free, it means we don't have any, let's say, advantages or fast development possibilities. So again, the thing is that companies don't analyze everything. They just get the basics, or some, uh, let's say, really understand the basics, and then they just jump. Now the question is also, again, do governments have the luxury to do the same, in order that you have extra gains or not? And given Estonia is in a situation where we need to jump forward in our development, so as we did with e-government, that it was, in a way, for us, a shortcut in development, can we do the same for the economy as a whole? So. I would stop here. I know that it's more probably questions than answers, but these were the, let's say, a couple of thoughts I, I wrote down on my flights. But I'm here uh, the rest of the day, and also uh, I have the pleasure to, to uh, lead one of the working groups. So if you are in my group, then we can continue. Thank you. We have time for just one question before then.
Listen. Just grab one there. Very. Is it on? Is it, it's on. Yeah. Uh, very quickly to reflect on sectorial mobility that you mentioned. I think it's a hugely important uh, aspect, and the universities with the hopefully growing uh, uh, research funding, one of the key goals will be to introduce what we call sustainable career models. And we are building in currently windows for researchers to exit from the university to entrepreneurial sectors, such that if they fail there, or even if they succeed but wa should want to come back to the university, would have that window so that we don't terminate their contracts but keep them open for a certain period uh, of time. I think that would alleviate the problem that you very rightly uh, uh, point in terms of inducing uh, uh, risk taking basically. But it's a just reflection yeah. really. No, I agree. I want, just wanted to say uh, maybe another comparison where government took the risk and it actually uh, it was the right one. Everything concerning the startup startup scene, it's mostly software-based. But 10 years ago, there was nothing. There was no money, there was only ideas, no money, no knowledge how to run it, nothing. Government took the risk, invested lots of money, also initially invested directly, meaning we didn't have you know, proper management skills to do with investments. Now, 10 years later, uh, we have on the market enough management skills. So government doesn't invest directly anymore. So we have professional fund managers who know, who understand the market, understand the idea, and really, really do it. Now we have to do it also in everywhere else that is not software, technology intensive as well. And this is where I think, again, we need to take the risk, academia and you know, private sector and government working together. First, probably it's costly. We have to really build up the, the, uh, the skills, the management skills. I think the competency will come. First, we fail. We definitely fail a lot, but we shouldn't, you know, be too worried about that. That is necessary. And then the management skills will come. And I think, you know, both sides, you know, will have more scientists with uh, skills how to run the business, and also more business leaders who understand the science. Exactly what what you said. How the people who should bring out good ideas from the laboratories and to commercialize them. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we have a time for, for a short coffee break. And pl please reconvene here uh, just uh, for eight minutes. Yeah? Then we can start at 4.10 again. Thank you very much.
Take a seat, please. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Thank you for returning in almost right time. And uh, we, we can start with the very last talk in, in this uh, session. And this is given by Professor Thomas Linertz from the Free University of uh, Brussels and he's an expert in artificial intelligence as I get, get it. Let me get this thing here. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come here for a second time. Uh, last time was already also very great to be here. It was more sunny than today, but even in the snow, uh, uh, Tallinn looks, looks very nice. Um, so, I'm here as one of the people involved in this very famous future ICT project 2.0, which actually tries to combine computational social sciences in trying to provide answers for uh, large questions. Um, and so the question, and last time when I was here, uh, Tarmo, I don't see immediately here uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the room, uh, convinced me to give a talk about something that I did like a long time ago, and I promised him if I would come back, I would tell you something about something recent that I'm doing. So this is what I'm presenting you today, something very novel we're doing in the lab. Uh, so please forgive me if I'm not as eloquent uh, in explaining all the details of what I'm doing there. So very briefly, uh, I'm from Brussels, so not from the European Union Commission, all these kind of things. I'm a professor at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, where I'm running the machine learning group 
with uh, my colleague Gianluca Bontempi, and we foc I, I myself in that lab focus on two main topics. On the right, you see AI uh, in questions about human behavior and collective intelligence. On the left, you see computational biology and bioinformatics, where I also like the first speaker that I saw here today, and working on predictive medicine and trying to understand when, is some, when somebody is ill and can we early identify the causes of diseases. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about uh, something else. And since this is a meeting about uh, uh, policy making, and maybe I should go here for a moment, since it's about policy making, I think I should start my first slide with policy making, right? And so these are all the famous people who were in 2015 in Paris trying to come to some kind of agreement or pledge what they were going to do about the global warming phenomenon. And so here they had, they had these debates, they had these uh, this, this nice uh, dinners, I'm assuming also, and they discussed what to do about the climate change problem. And uh, they pledged there to make sure that their CO2 emissions actually would be lowered in such a way that at some point it would not go beyond the 1.5 or 2 degrees temperature increase globally in the world. And pledges are very nice, but if you put pledges next to facts, you get this. Right? And you get this, and this is a nice website called uh, Climate Action Tracker, and it shows you how good everybody is in actually trying to meet the criteria of staying below this 2, two degree or 1.5 degree uh, global warming increase. And as you notice, like I do, I hope, there's only like Morocco there on the left that's doing a good job. The rest is actually completely failing in their pledges. Yeah? Uh, sadly, Europe is put on one big pile, so we cannot distinguish clearly between the countries. But at least you see there, we're still in the uh, in insufficient area, like uh, Australia or Brazil, and then you have some other countries who just are black, who just remove themselves uh, from the entire agreement and are critically insufficient. So what we see here is what, what I could call a severe case of procrastination. Uh, people are just saying, oh, yeah, it's important, it's important, but uh, technology will come, it will solve the problem, or tomorrow we will make a new legislation and we promise to do something here uh, for tomorrow. And clearly this is not the way to go because pledges are non-binding and people just can promise whatever they want and the problem is will they actually do whatever they promised. And so just to give you an example, what is at stake and just to give the, the summary of things, so it might, if we don't do anything now, what people have been showing in scientific research is that by 2050, we will have this 2% increase. By 2100, we will have this 3 to 4% temperature increase, which will mean that Europe, as, a, as an area, will become uh, 2 to 14 times more dry. I just heard somebody talking about forest issues, forest fires here in Estonia. You can bet that this, will increase, this problem will increase over time if nothing is done uh, about this problem. Uh, in my country, and then I put some nice pictures on the top, and so the, the nice red dot is where I live in Belgium. And so you see that at some point I will have my personal island, right? If it goes to four degrees, then I'm living on my personal island over there, which is maybe a good thing. We have to check it out whether it's true or not. But at least we know already that if this goes on, then all the protections that are done to, to, to stop the block, the sea coming into the land, have to be increased, used investments have to be made, and so dikes have to be uh, improved. And this will also have an effect on agriculture, because for instance, in, in Flanders in Belgium here, these are huge agricultural areas, right? So if you start having floodings and salt water, water seeping into the soil, then uh, you will actually destroy your, your uh, agricultural production. And so people have uh, agreed, okay, what do we have to do in order to remain below this 1.5? And actually, I just want to show this list, not to say that we have to do it now immediately. Of course, we have to do this kind of things, but also to show that there are targets that can be met. People have certain targets that they need to meet to actually trying to avoid this kind of problem. And so there has to be, of course, investment in renewable energies. We have to try to be CO2 neutral by 2050, preferably earlier. We actually have to increase the forest instead of decreasing it. There's a nice paper by Griscom et al. showing uh, in PNAS uh, discussing natural climate solutions. And the biggest solution for the climate change is to add forest. So if you add forest the size of Australia, you might already solve the big problem. Now we have the problem that 40 football fields disappear per minute uh, worldwide. Okay, so this is a huge issue. Another problem is population growth. It's the increase of humans on the planet that actually is causing this problem at the same time. And this was already discussed by Garrett Hardy in 1968, saying this is a huge problem and we need policy-making solutions to overcome this problem. We cannot keep on growing like we've been growing and actually we have ignored this since 1968. So these are all different kind of tasks, tasks that actually 
policy making has to play an important role in, right? So the question actually comes, okay, what is the problem? So this Sunday, there was again a march in Brussels by an organization, uh, there were, were 70,000 people again to uh, wake up the Belgian government, or at least hopefully one of our governments, uh, that they should actually take some actions. And even there's a nice interesting phenomenon, we have children from secondary school who decide, okay, enough is enough, you're playing with our future, from now on, we're going to protest every Thursday. We're going to skip school. So actually, they're not allowed to skip school. They can get punished for that. They're skipping school. And now, this Thursday, there were again 12,500 kids protesting in Brussels uh, because the Belgian government and all the regional governments do not take any actions. But of course, it's, 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 you, could expect, you could have expected this problem in a sense that if you have to trust people's pledges in order to achieve some kind of goal, and you do not back this up with repercussions, the chance of actually meeting those pledges is quite low, right? And so in order to have pledges, you, uh, good pledges, you have to have trust among all the participants, and you have to have cooperative participants in the sense that they're all willing to make a change. And this is, of course, not always the case. And also there was a UN report in, uh, not so long ago that actually said, look, with all the pledges that have been done in Paris, forget about it, we'll never achieve the goal. So we have to step up. And nicely, I had the paper myself. I don't exactly remember when it was, but the title of the paper was Good Agreements Make Good Friends. I don't know whether there's like the same saying in Estonian uh, for these kind of things, but uh, there's the same saying also in Dutch. And, and we clearly show that if you, if you expect to have non-costly, non-enforced agreements, then this will only lead to defection and people will not cooperate in the long run. Okay? So, why is it so hard to arrive at an agreement? And this is a nice example showing uh, the conflict between all the different regional governments uh, in, in, in my own country. Uh, and I think, personally, for me, I was, I, when I looked at this problem, I said, okay, I think this is a behavioral problem. It's a problem where uh, people are confusing long-term, uh, people have a problem in uh, uh, arriving at uh, long-term uh, benefits because they're focusing on short-term gains, right? We heard you talking before, we have to increase the economy of Estonia, we have to do this, we have to do that, but you might be doing this now as a benefit in the short term, but in the long term this might arrive with a cost. And this is clearly what's happening here with the entire climate discussion. All the countries want to have an economic uh, uh, certainty in their country. Uh, uh, they want to make sure that people have jobs, that people have a good income, that people can buy whatever they want. But in the long term, this kind of behavior may lead to disastrous effects. And this is something that, we, that scientists have to explain, in my opinion, to policymakers because they have a very narrow time window. They have the elections. Uh, up, I don't know how long it is here, but in our case it's four to five years. So everything that happens has to happen in this four to five year period. And long term, things are much more difficult to establish. So what is the problem here? Very simply put, we are now here at a certain level of emissions and we're looking at some point in the future, which is a long term uh, perspective. And we have a number of countries or, or, or regions or, or cities or whatever you want, and they have to actually uh, come take a collective action. They have to agree about arriving at some kind of solution. And what is the solution? They have to make sure that the CO2 level is going down to a certain threshold. And so what they do is they have to think about policies that allows them to reduce this. But of course, if you want to reduce this, which means you have to change current human behavior, current human consumption, current company consumption of energy. Uh, we have to think about this kind of stuff and how can we actually do this kind of things. So that's why I showed you before these different kind of targets. These targets have to be achieved at some point in the future. And if we're below that point, we're all happy. Uh, we live longer, the planet is safe, we can do whatever we want. If we're above that threshold, then there are some consequences, like more forest fires, uh, uh, bigger problems with, with water supply, and all these kind of things. So are people actually able to coordinate to reach that, actually, that, that solution? And then you can say, yes, if you, if, if you set up the system right, you can actually coordinate your actions. You can coordinate how much you want to invest. And if everybody is cooperative and everybody is trustworthy, this thing will actually work by itself. But in this problem, there's a lot of uncertainties. One uncertainty is the impact, right? If I arrive at this threshold, does this mean that it will be the same conditions like we had 50 years ago? Or will be still other kinds of conditions of the climate that are still more severe than what we had before? Uh, also, also, another problem is, okay, this threshold. How clear-cut is this threshold? There can be uncertainty about this threshold. So is it this level or that level? Or should we even go lower than that to make sure that it can, it, we don't have that problem in the long run? 
And then the final uncertainty is when will this happen? You can put the threshold, but okay, does it mean that we're going to arrive this threshold at this point in time or another point in time? And all these uncertainties will influence decision making. They will influence policy making because people are either uh, very much aware of the issue or they are not very much aware of the issue or they have other agendas and they have to follow those other agendas. So from a science perspective, there's a lot of people, and not only me because I, I feel more like an amateur in this field, but a lot of people doing uh, combinations of social sciences and computer sciences to understand human behavior and how human behavior affects decision making. Yeah? And so what we do most of the time is either we start from on the top here behavioral experiments and then we analyze those experiments of how humans behave in real case scenarios and we see what's happening there and then we can build models of what they're doing and trying to make predictions based on the data that we have. Or we can go to large scale data sets like the first speaker was talking about and then do, uh, see what kind of patterns there are in these data sets that can help in policy making uh, uh, decisions. I will focus now briefly today on one aspect, which is the behavioral experiment, because I think it's much more anecdotal and it's much more easier to grab than going into the mathematics of behavioral modeling and all this kind of thing. So I want to start with showing you an example. So there was this very famous guy who lives in Germany in the north, in Plön, and he actually wrote a paper called Collective Risk, Social Dilemma and the Prevention of this Climate Change Problem. And he said, okay, let's make a very abstract setup and let's assume that we have groups of four people. And these four people all get some money. They get 24 credits. And then what they have to do is they have to put money in a pot. So at time one here, they put something here. At time two, they put something there and so on. But by the end, they have to arrive at 48 credits in the common pot. If they arrive at the 48 credits, the plant is saved and there's no problem. If they're below, there is an issue. So just to make it more visible, so in the beginning, these four people maybe add each uh, their own part. And so you see the arrows are explaining how much. So the dotted line is zero contribution, the blue line is two contribution, and the green line is four contribution. And they gradually start filling up the pot. And every time they make their decision until they arrive here, and you see here at this situation, they did not arrive at the, the, the final amount. They are four below the threshold. So now there is a, an uncertainty on the impact. So what's happening is that they might lose the money they have in their pockets. Right? And so how do we decide that they're going to lose the money that's in their pockets? Ah, there's a, there are three possibilities. Either there's a 90% chance that you lose everything, so one, one times out of 10 you can keep your money, nine times out of 10 you have to give the money back, and you cannot keep it. The other one is 50%, this means that half the time you can keep your money, half the time you have to give it back, and 10% of risk, which means that you can, nine times out of 10 you can keep your money, right? even though you did not invest a lot. Okay? And so this experiment was done with a number of people, right? And the data was collected to see, okay, how do these people behave? Will they be able, always be able to reach this 44%, uh, 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 sorry, this uh, 48 threshold, or will they fail, right? Uh, maybe a quick quiz. So how many of you think that they will always achieve the threshold when there's a 90% risk, when there's nine times out of 10 you will lose your money if you do not reach that threshold? Just raise your hands. How many think yes? They will reach it all the time. Only three, okay? Here with the 50%, will they always reach this threshold or will they also uh, keep the, try to keep as much money as they can for themselves? So raise your hand. A bit more people are saying, okay. And so we can keep on going, but I will show you the results. So in the actual experiments, it was, this was abstract, the actual experiments, every group consisted of six players. They played for 10 rounds and they had to achieve 120, okay? And so what you see here is what happened. So this is interesting because, so, in the groups that played, if you look at when there was a 90% risk, so there was a high chance if you do not reach the threshold that you will lose all your money, only, let's say, a bit more than 50% actually achieved in, that, in getting to that goal. Right? When there was a 50% chance of losing your money, people were actually even worse because they actually uh, arrived at almost 90% of not achieving that goal. And when there was a 10% chance, nobody cared. They just were giving as few, little as possible in, in, the, in the system, and they, uh, because otherwise uh, they couldn't keep that much, because in the end, whatever happened with the experiment, if they, in the end of the experiment, they could keep what was in their pockets, right? Not what was in the public account. So this is interesting because this seems to, to indicate that if there's uncertainty about the, uh, the impact of this problem, you, will, you still see people, even with a higher risk, they're not achieving to reach that goal. And, now the, and then this is important, why? Because we ask our politicians to play more or less the same game, right? They have to invest 
countrywide in, uh, in diminishing uh, the CO2 emission. But what you see is that even for this little experiment, it's very hard to achieve actually that goal. So you need to actually solve this problem in a different way. I'm going to skip this for now. But then, of course, as always in science, people say, yeah, but your model is too simple. You're forgetting about this, you're forgetting about that. And there was also another very nice paper by Tavoni and colleagues who said, okay, first of all, not every country is as rich as every other country. So you should take that into account. Uh, and, and second of all, if you talk about agreements, then people should be able to communicate. Right? So if you would have communication in this previous system, then it might lead to real, uh, to better solutions. So they actually did exactly the same experiment. So I'll just show you the schema again. So they did exactly the same experiment. So they said, okay, people are in groups. They can offer zero, two, or four. Uh, I'm gonna, so, and so they started at giving money, but in their experiment, they made a little change. They said, okay, in the beginning of the experiment, the computer is gonna take some money off your account and put it into pot. And in this baseline experiment, Everybody contributes in the beginning the same amount. I will, it will, will become clear after this why this is important. But for this case, so they started giving themselves at this point, and they all start with the same amount in their private accounts. And again, they had to arrive at this 48 uh, threshold. And in, they only focused on the scenario where 50% of the people, uh, uh, sorry, 50% of the time, you lose your money. So even if you don't reach the threshold, half of the time you can keep what's in your pocket. That's what this scenario actually is. And then they said, okay, this is the baseline experiment. So now what happens if they can make pledges like they were doing in the Paris Agreement? People said, okay, I pledge to invest 10 to arrive at the final uh, amount. Or I pledge to arrive six to arrive at the final amount, right? Now this situation, everybody has the same wealth. In the other situation, the computer is not equally putting money from everybody in the account. It's randomly picking for some people more and for some people less. Which means that when you start making decisions yourself, some already have given more to the account than others. Right? And so what you would be expecting and what you would be hoping for in a fair society is that uh, these people that have more will also start contributing more than those people that have less. Right? And that's the idea of introducing inequality in this kind of system. And for the rest, it remained the same. And they also add on top of that the idea of pledges, like, okay, this guy says, I'm pledging four, this guy is pledging 10, this guy is pledging 12, and this guy is pledging six. And then we see what's happening if they're actually going to play the game. Okay? And so this is what happened. And this is quite interesting because, indeed, they were right. They said, okay, if you have communication going on before you start playing the game and you make this kind of pledge, how much you're going to invest, you see that if you compare the, the base without the pledge and then the pledge, you see a huge increase in success of this, of this particular result. It's not 100%, but it's way more than what you had, what you had before. And if you then uh, start from the, this unequal uh, system also, so without the pledge and with the pledge, so without the pledge in an unequal scenario, it actually is less good because if you compare the previous base with that one, you see it actually goes down. But once you add a pledge again, it actually increases. So pledging system seems to help in actually getting uh, the job done. But, it's, but what it mostly shows that communication is essential. What it also is very important is that when they compare groups that are successful and groups that fail, is that uh, successful groups make honest pledges. So I can promise whatever I want, but if I'm not following what I promise, then I actually have a higher risk of failing in this kind of experiments. So if I'm matching whatever I promised, then actually it actually works best. And also interesting, they were showing in this experiment that the groups that are successful are those groups where the rich contribute more than the poor. If, if the rich are not willing to give more for this, uh, for this, in this system, they have a higher likelihood of failing to reach the, the, the level. So this was a quite interesting extension. So to focus now a bit on what I'm doing myself, it's about the uncertainty of timing. So because my title was, it's about uncertainty. So at least I'll tell you a bit more about uncertainty. And so uncertainty about timing means the following. So we had the setup of before, and we have four players, they each have money, they have to reach the threshold at a certain point in time. But like I said, it might not be that point in time. It might be earlier, or it might be later, right? So what we're doing now in this expansion of this experiment is say, okay, Let's make two levels of uncertainty. One where we say there's a one in three probability that uh, you're ready from round eight, the, the game will stop. You will have to reach the threshold by then. Another one where there's a huge, a bigger uncertainty where starting from round six, there's a one in five probability that the, the game will end. 
And the point is simply here that, on average, in all those cases, the game ends at 10 rounds. Okay? And then we ask a question, okay, what do people do if they are, are confronted with this kind of uncertainty? And so this is the work of a PhD student of mine, Elias Fernandez, uh, is working on that topic. So what we see is that if you have the classical Malinsky experiment and there's no uncertainty, then uh, in case of when there's a 90% risk of losing your money, we have more or less the same as the result that they were showing before. If you increase uncertainty a bit, what happens is that the group achievements are more or less the same. It's only when uncertainty increases far enough that you see a drop uh, in the results. Interestingly, if you then look at the groups that are successful in dealing with this kind of uncertainty, you see that if there's little uncertainty, they tend to invest more. So they're actually compensating the behavior and trying to invest more. But this drops down again when there actually is a higher level of uncertainty. And you also see this kind of compensating hap happening in the, in the donations. So this is um, how much they, uh, in green you see here, that they give more than the average amount that they have in their private account. Or he, in blue is what they, that they give exactly the half of what's in their private account. And in light blue is they give, they give less than what's in their private account. And what you see is that if uncertainty increases, then actually you see the more extreme behaviors popping up more frequently. And so we analyze that more in detail. I'm not okay. Just to say, tell you that we represent every person by the action that he or she is, or she is taking and the actions of the other ones. So if I make a decision, I can look at what the other ones have been doing, and I can use this as information to make a decision. So that's used now to represent every agent, and what or every person. Sorry. And what we see in our analysis is that between the three different treatments, there's a huge difference in behavior uh, if you take only that information into account. And so if we analyze this in more detail, uh, what we see, for instance, here, this is the behavior. So we, we analyze all the, the people in the experiment, and we find three clusters. And you see these clusters, we can analyze them in different ways. But in this case, we see uh, first, um, again, what do they do in the first half of the game or in the second half of the game? So in the first cluster, 78% of the time they reached uh, the goal. In the second cluster, it's only 58% of the time. And in the third cluster, 64% of the time, but you see that there's not like a huge difference in behavior. You see that those that are successful or more successful give more fair amounts in the beginning, and those that are less successful actually are a bit lower in that, in that area. And if you look at the, the let's, let's call it reciprocal behavior, so on the x-axis you see what your neighbors got, gave in the round before you, and then what people do, and you see that independently of what they do, you mostly are giving fair, fair responses. Uh, to, this to the players. But if we add uncertainty, something is shifting. Suddenly you see here that there's a, an increase in donation in this first part of the, of, the, of, the, of the game, and then a huge decrease, especially here, much less there, in, this, in these two clusters. And we see also that if we go look at in the individual behavior, we suddenly see this popping up of these huge higher blue peaks, which corresponds to giving four in a game. So what you see is that if you're on that side of the curve, people have given not enough in the, in the previous round. So in order to make sure that you reach the target, people are compensating by giving the blue thing, which is giving four. In this, in this right half here, what you see is that people gave more than half before in the previous round. So what people are doing is they're giving less in, the, in, this, in this situation. So what you have is a kind of compensating behavior, and it nicely shows that the cluster that has this kind of compensating behavior has a higher chance of reaching the, the, the ultimate goal. And if then for the last round, you see it even more extreme, you see clearly now this, sh this balancing out, but the problem is now that even with this compensating behavior, the actual probability of ending up with, uh, with a successful uh, uh, outcome actually went down. So what to conclude from all this, right? Because in this, essentially what, what I'm showing you is, is okay, how do people make decisions, policy decisions, when they play this kind of games, what they should invest, what they should not invest, and how uh, uh, does uncertainty affect the outcome, right? And so I hope that I convey to you that this timing uncertainty might have a role to play in the success of reaching this threshold. Yeah? When the timing is well established, with, with that I mean that if, the, if, if you have a clear goal like it's at round 10 you need to have the threshold or it's around round 9 of round 11 that's a clear well established timing then success can be attained by simply being a bit more generous and that's what you saw in the first case that i showed you but and what we also see what we appear to see in these results is that this timing uncertainty 
seems to influence the perception of risk. Before, it was sufficient to be fair, but suddenly you have this uncertainty coming into the game, and so you need to think, okay, if I don't give enough now, we never might reach the threshold, so there's a higher risk for me to be fair, so I should be more generous. But then I compensate this by actually, in the round where everybody gave more, to give less myself because I want to keep more in my pocket. Right? This is what you see what's happening there. Uh, and so they use this kind of compensating behavior to resolve the uncertainty. Giving more when others gave not enough, giving less when they provide uh, enough. But this breaks down if your uncertainty goes further. And so that's why you see this drop in this, in this next stage. So this compensating behavior works only until, until a certain point. And then afterwards you are, have, have a problem and things go down again. Uh, and so clearly this higher uncertainty for us, the way we're interpreting the results at the moment, is that it strengthens the conflict between personal gains and being sufficiently generous. So because in the end, like I said, these people leave the experiment with the money in their pockets, right? So they are, their ambition is to go away with as much as possible, right? And higher the uncertainty, the more problems they have of meeting the goal, so they're actually reluctant and they will try to, uh, to give less. And again, communication might resolve this issue. We haven't checked this yet, but it might be that if we have these pledges again, also in this uncertainty environment, that it might be a solution. The question will also be, only becomes how much a solution. Uh, and this, of course, is work for uh, future research. Voila, and here I end my story. I hope it was not too long. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, and uh, we have plenty of time uh, for questions. Probably here for the first time. Thank you. I actually have a very simple question. Uh, what uh, Dr. Wasser said before, it seems that you have, a, let's say, market ready product. I just wonder that, you know, how easy it is in your case in Belgium to, uh, to deliver that to the decision makers. Have you ever been to Belgium? <laughs> So first of all, you have to know that there are like uh, a gazillion number of, of uh, governments in our country. So this is not an easy discussion. That's why I also showed you this little cartoon in the beginning about why is it so hard to make an agreement, because this showed our current vice, our current m uh, president of the Flemish community who is, uh, uh, was a bit reluctant to give in to the climate uh, discussion uh, in Flanders, and this blocked the entire climate discussion in Belgium. So, so this story is not easy. But I'm expecting now with all the fuss that, that, that children and scientists and parents are making, and they're planning to keep this up until the next elections, so this is May, uh, that they will have to listen at some point. Uh, because otherwise, what is the use of democracy in the end if people are not listening to what you're talking about? So I never told the story outside Tallinn. <laughs> Maybe there's an opportunity to do that at some point. Uh, but so far, I think the discussion is not easy. But I think we're evolving. But it, it re always remains the discussion about economy and, and job creation and against uh, offering, uh, getting, uh, sacrificing certain uh, uh, benefits we have in function of this problem. And in the end, it will come down to sacrificing certain benefits that we have. Uh, like the fact that if you want to go to the reduce CO2 emission, why should I then take the plane to Tallinn, for instance? Right? Because this is, a, and at price that, that we are now paying, it's ridiculously cheap in many cases. So this is one of the discussions that has to be had about pricing and things like that. More questions, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is also simple. Your study was based on a random person from a street. No, these are no, no, no. These are students. Students. Uh, and, but this is a this is a lab setting. There's no uh, uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, children of five. No. But you try to um, extrapolate to the members of parliament. Would that be a fair... I mean, you have to use the parliament members in, in your experiments. This would be a very cool thing to do, and I think we, we should at some point try to do that. And if, if somebody asked me, ah, you're asking me, can I get across? It would be a nice thing to test. It's like the, this morning, this lady from the European Commission was mentioning that they have this science meets parliament activity. It would be nice to have those people play that game and see how they, uh, <laughs> see how they, how they respond to this kind of thing. Um, I, from my, in my opinion, in the end, these are students doing these experiments. So these are non-politicians, uh, but they're also uh, young people. So you're going to have a difference in age, uh, and all these kind of things might play a role. 
so it would be cool to do that kind of things, but it's always a question of people, resources, and to actually make these kind of things happen. Yes, back there. Um, I'm not familiar with this type of experimentation, so I have a, perhaps a stupid question. There are no stupid <laughs> questions. <laughs> These, uh, uh, the players that you recruit, they play with money that you give them at the outset of the, uh, of the game. And so the, uh, they, they either gain something or lose the money you gave them, but not their own money. And uh, now it's... Uh, in, in psychological experimentation, it is a known fact that risk aversion is a stronger feeling than uh, uh, a hope, hope for gain. Yeah. So if you had a situation where they actually were at risk of losing their own money rather than the money you gave them, do you think that would influence the situation? I cannot make any scientifically un uh, supported uh, statements about that, but I can, I can estimate that, that you, will, might, you might see a difference, but it might skew the curve a bit. I'm not sure whether it will change the overall outcome. It might skew the curve a bit. But uh, for instance, there's one experiment I didn't mention you uh, here. I, I didn't know if I, I talked fast, so I wasn't expecting that I, that I would get a lot of time for saying everything. But there's another experiment where actually they get like a separate wallet of money that they also lose. And they try to simulate this kind of idea, like next to the money they get for doing the, for doing the experiment, they have a separate wallet that they have a guarantee of, of getting. But if they fail, then they actually lose the separate wallet also. And, and this they try to mimic this kind of circumstance. Of course, it's, it remains a lab experiment, eh? so it's difficult to do. Uh, but I'm expecting you will see similar results. And in that experiment, they actually showed that uh, the threshold, so the variation of the, um, the threshold that you have to achieve is a huge factor um, in the decision process. So if there's a lot, large variation on the decision on the threshold, then the, the, there's like a cutting, there's like a tipping point. At some point, all cooperation just disappears. Uh, and this is actually a, a strong effect. So it's very important for scientists then again to be clear and correct about their statements. Because if they if you give uncertain and fuzzy advices to politicians, then they will maybe act like what we're seeing here, right? And so this is why, why the, the interaction between science and policy making, I think, is very important. Thank you. It is very interesting. And I have a question of just because of curiosity. You mentioned several times the issue of communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any idea how much type of communication could influence? Uh, I mean, like in the one corner we have a high-level bureaucracy. It is also communication, but often we meet in the public sector and the policy, and in the other side maybe very open, honest uh, talks or, or maybe fights or whatever. Have you, do you have any idea about this? I really liked your remark about the risk neutrality uh, before, because essentially politicians are more or less risk averse because there's an influence on their short term period in which they're in government. So they want to avoid things that have a negative impact on, in, in, the, in the long run for their elections. And the, in, this, in this way, I think it's important to, uh, uh, this risk averse thing that you were mentioning actually comes back to that, and that's for, and a very important issue in, in solving this problem, in my opinion. So I, I think there is an issue there. Yeah. There is one more question, very well, um, last one. A yeah. similar probably aspect of the questions that just been asked. Yeah. It would be interesting to repeat this experiment and have groups where people actually had something to lose, like not being able to pay rent or buy food, something very basic, and groups where people have had a bit more discretionary sort of income to play with. Yeah, yeah. Because I think what we're seeing, for example, in France and Paris with Yellow West is a very good reflection of that difference that some people just can't afford to take risks. So and is, no matter how much they may be willing to, yeah, yeah. for things to change and sort of do good things for the society, they just can't afford it. But this is the inequality issue, right? I mean, this is the entire, but then inside one country is the fact that if, you, you, if you're going to install measures that try to solve this climate issue, you're going to affect people. And if you're going to affect the, the weaker class mm. as strongly as the richer class, you have an issue because they cannot afford it. And it's more, I have more people with a lower income than people with a, with a high income. 
Yeah, but in the, in the way policy works at the moment in, say, developed countries, there is a policy that affects the whole of, whole of the population. If you raise taxes or prices for petrol, it affects everybody in the same way, and there is no inbuilt flexibility usually, or very often to reflect. I fully agree, but I, in my opinion, they could have seen that coming in France. I mean, when they installed oh, this yeah, policy, yeah, they could yeah. have expected, this, this is again for me a nice sign where they don't think about human behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are installing yeah, no, a policy and they could have expected this kind of response. And for instance, they tried also this yellow vest movement in the south of Belgium. There's also a huge French population, uh, there's a mostly French population, and they have a very uh, strong affini affinity with, with Paris and with France. And they tried to do the same thing, but in Belgium, the difference was not that big, so this never took off, mm -hmm. like it did in France. And so this is, I think, they, sh they could have seen that coming. I mean, this is just stupidity, in my opinion, when they put that policy there. Yeah, but that just highlights the yeah, issue yeah, yeah. that's inbuilt issue that is there, and it yeah. will play out in different ways and different. So, in, in that sense, for instance, I like a lot of future ICT projects because the project is actually saying you need to build models that allow you to understand the impact of your decisions on society, uh, to, uh, to grasp what's going on. And this, and I mean, I don't think many politicians have a dynamical system model on their computer to say, okay, if I do that policy, it has that impact on, on society, it will really affect those people. Mm -hmm. And that's also what, in my opinion, they need. They need to, answer, to understand the consequences of certain policies on the population. Yeah, but not just acknowledge that there is no society, there are groups within society that no, are no, quite no. very different. In All the groups, what? everything mapped yeah, out, this kind of yeah. thing. No, I fully agree. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, it was very interesting. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll give you, give you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Session. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, today, as well as uh, people from the audience, for the uh, very disciplined uh, behavior and keeping up uh, precisely the time. And uh, now, before we, we turn over the workshops, uh, Tarma would like to have some, uh, some word about the organization. Uh, yes, some necessary housekeeping. Uh, but before housekeeping, uh, I just imagine whether the experiments of Tom could be repeated twice in Estonia during the last week of the existing parliament and second one during the first week of the new parliament. That would be a really scientific result. Can you or pack your experiments into one week or even into a shorter time? Yes. One day, is it also possible? Sorry? 101 persons. Not sample, the population. Then we should, we should then go into, into the room which is uh, led by Marco Pomerantz and start talking about that. It might be possible, at least it's not excluded. And it might be a nice outcome of, of uh, our exercise. So now is coming the second best part of the, of the event. The very best is dinner. You don't know all that. The group work. Uh, many of you probably haven't recognized that this building is a five-story building. We are, going to, we are going to use uh, for network three stories of that. This is the lowest. And then there are two other floors. And some, the most selected ones, will go into a very specific room. It's the former, former room of headquarters of early masonry in Estonia. It's only used in exceptional cases, and we avoid using that room alone and around midnight. So this will set clear time limits for discussion in that room. The group leaders will know, or they should know, what the rooms are. So try to gather around them. Some of them have already, have already presented, and the others then must make some noise. One group work will be here. One group work will be 
uh, in the office um, of the President of Academy, which is also opened only in very exceptional cases, and then two others are up to the fifth floor. Uh, whenever you, you feel you are lost, you look around, there are arrows everywhere where to go, and there, are, there is our staff helping you with all questions. It is really important that um, somebody in the group tries to make some notes. They need not to be perfect or, or written in, in perfect, uh, perfect handwriting. Um, it is important that we gather together the best ideas and share them with others. You have seen from Tom's um, presentation that if, even if you have a massive uncertainty, communication will sort out things. This is what is necessary, and I really hope that somebody from the group will be brave enough uh, to uh, reflect a few ideas, three minutes, maximum five minutes, during the dinner. And we shall reconvene for the dinner here. Um, the catering will start uh, reshaping the room uh, when the group led by Tom, is finishing around 6 p.m. They're given half an hour, and now there comes the meaning of hands-on training. Please help the catering to move the chairs and put up the tables. This is hands-on training, what Zoe promised to you. Everybody has a chance to help. Um, so, that's it. Try to fill uh, the rooms for discussion maximally, and as I'm saying, it's, it's it will definitely be the second best part of the conference. And be sharp and open in your discussions. We use so-called Chatham House Rule, which means that everything what is said in discussion could be cited or repeated, but we shall not link the citation with a person. This is really important. You shouldn't be afraid that your name will go together with your words. But if you find that your words are important, then tell it what you, what you think. And your name, if you don't wish so, uh, will not be revealed. OK, then, now start speak turbulence. Going into, into uh, work groups, and now those who are sitting not in this room, it's your choice whether you end around 6 p.m. in one hour or you continue and, and go perhaps into hotel if you wish to visit our uh, cold wave and, and dirty roads, you can do so, but you can easily continue until around uh, uh, half past six and then come here um, without participating in hands-on training in reshaping the room. So, welcome to the group work. <laughs>